you, Priscilla. And, and thanks all of you for coming. C can you hear me okay? Is this, is this working? Okay. All right, today I'm going to tell you about some work that we've been doing to identify mechanisms of hemoglobin adaptation to hypoxia in high altitude vertebrates. And as my title suggests, this work is mainly motivated by questions about the, the, the causes of parallel molecular evolution. So th these questions have important uh, uh, implications for understanding the, the inherent repeatability and therefore predictability of evolutionary change at the genetic level. So in today's talk, I'll, I'll start by providing a conceptual overview and I'll explain the evolutionary significance of the questions that we're addressing. I'll then provide some background information and I'll present the results of several case studies of hemoglobin evolution in mammals and birds. And then finally, I'll describe some of the insights we've obtained into mechanisms of biochemical adaptation and the causes of parallel molecular evolution. So the, the, the convergent evolution of organismal phenotypes, like the capacity for powered flight, has always been of interest to evolutionary biologists. And th these patterns of, of phenotypic convergence have a, a fairly conventional evolutionary explanation, right? If, if a given design is good enough to evolve once, then the same underlying design principle is typically good enough to evolve multiple times. Now, an important question in, in evolutionary genetics concerns the extent to which adaptive phenotypic convergence is attributable to parallel changes at the underlying genetic level. And, and one especially powerful means to, to address this question is to examine phylogenetically replicated changes in protein function that can be traced to specific amino acid substitutions. This allows us to, to establish a direct mechanistic connection between genotype and phenotype. So, um, so this is what we're doing. We're examining the, the molecular basis of convergence in hemoglobin function in comparisons involving phylogenetically replicated pairs of high and low altitude sister taxa, several of which are, are shown here. So the first step is to, is to test for evidence of convergence in, in, in hemoglobin function. And then the second step is to identify the, the causative mutational changes. Now for our particular system, as a first step to, to test for evidence of convergence in protein function, we first need to address a question that, that's of long-standing interest in the field of comparative physiology. And that is, have high altitude vertebrate taxa typically evolved elevated hemoglobin oxygen affinities relative to their lowland counterparts? Now, I, I won't go into the, the, the physiological details here, but, but suffice it to say that under conditions of severe hypoxia, as, as we, we, we would encounter at very high altitudes, theory predicts that it's generally beneficial to have an elevated hemoglobin oxygen affinity. The, the basic trick is to, to safeguard arterial oxygen saturation while simultaneously maintaining an adequate diffusion gradient between the capillary blood and the tissue mitochondria. So one clear prediction is that derived increases in hemoglobin oxygen affinity will have evolved repeatedly in disparate vertebrate taxa that have independently colonized high altitude environments. So if this pattern of phenotypic convergence, if this predicted pattern of phenotypic convergence is confirmed by comparative studies, then we can step in and address some really important questions about protein evolution. So for example, do repeated evolutionary changes in hemoglobin function typically involve the same structural mechanism? And if so, do such changes typically in involve parallel substitutions at the amino acid sequence level? Now, there, there are two main reasons why we might expect convergence in protein function to involve parallel amino acid substitutions. First, it, it may be that there's simply a limited number of mutations that are capable of producing the requisite change in phenotype. So you can think of this as the, the, the forced option hypothesis. 
So this would simply reflect uh, uh, an intrinsic constraint that's imposed by the nature of structure function relationships. Alternatively, it may be that there are many possible mutations that are capable of producing the, the requisite change in phenotype. But sites may vary in, in rates of mutation to alleles that produce the change. That is, there may be mutation bias. Or mutations may vary in their probability of fixation once they arise. That is, there may be fixation bias. So if, if we ask the question of whether, whether particular mutations are fixed preferentially during the course of protein evolution, this is equivalent to asking whether, on average, substitution rates are equivalent across sites. So this just shows how, uh, under, under the simplest uh, origin fixation model, the, the rate of substitution is proportional to the rate at which new mutations arise and the probability that a mutation is fixed once it has arisen. So mutation bias, uh, we have a pretty, a pretty good handle on the, the, the different sources of mutation bias. In the case of fixation bias, um, this can be caused by a number of different factors. As I mentioned before, it, it may be that there are, within a given protein coding gene, there may be many, many possible mutations that are capable of producing the same phenotypic effect. But those mutations may still be unequal in the, in the eyes of natural selection. That is, they, they, they may have unequal fixation probabil probabilities due to, um, for example, variation in pleiotropic side effects or, or epistatic interactions. And for, for the purpose of today's talk, it's these epistatic interactions I want to focus on. So epistasis is simply defined as a, a non-additive interaction between mutations. So if we take the, a, a simple case of um, uh, two mutant sites in the same protein, If, if mutations at those sites have, have additive effects, then the phenotype of the, the double mutant is simply equal to the sum of the individual effects of each mutation by itself. And by contrast, if there's an epistatic interaction between allelic variants at the two sites, then the phenotype of the double mutant is either greater than or less than the sum of the individual effects of each mutation by itself. Now these are both examples where the magnitude of a mutation's effect depends on genetic background. It may also be the case that the sign of a mutation's effect depends on genetic background. So in other words, the, the same mutation can, can uh, increase a, 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 um, a phenotypic trait value on one genetic background and produce the opposite effect on a different background. So theory predicts that this so-called sign epistasis um, should exert an especially profound influence on trajectories of, of protein evolution. And to understand why, I'll, I'll, I'll explain why um, using a, a hypothetical example. So this example is hypothetical, but it also allows me to explain the basic experimental approach that we're using with this work. So let's say that we're, we're measuring the, the functional properties of purified hemoglobins from a pair of high and low altitude sister species. And let's say that our experiments reveal that the hemoglobin of the high, al high altitude species has a higher oxygen affinity than that of the lowland species. And, and let's say that by, by cloning and sequencing the genes that encode the alpha and beta chain subunits of the hemoglobin tetramer, we discover that this evolved change in protein function must be attributable to the independent or joint effects of substitutions at these three sites. And in, in each case, it's the, the, the derived variant that's fixed in the high altitude species. So to measure the additive and non-additive effects of, of these mutations, we use a, a protein engineering approach based on site-directed mutagenesis. So specifically, we, we make use of a, a, an expression vector system that we developed, which allows us to synthesize recombinant hemoglobin 
in E. coli host cells. So using this, this system, we can then synthesize uh, recombinant hemoglobin mutants representing all possible genotypic combinations of allelic variation at the sites of interest. So in this particular case, we're concerned with changes at a total of three sites. So we need to make exactly three, or uh, rather eight recombinant hemoglobin mutants representing, uh, first of all, the wild type genotype of the low altitude species, which in this case also represents the ancestral genotype. Then we also make the triple mutant genotype of the high altitude species. And finally, we synthesize each of the six mutational intermediates that connect them. So this cube diagram just provides a, a graphical depiction of genotype space, where each vertex of the cube represents a, a, di a discrete three-site genotype, and each edge of the cube connects genotypes that are connected by a single mutational step. So what you can see here in this case is, is that the, the ancestral low affinity genotype and the derived high affinity genotype are connected by six possible mutational pathways. That is, if, if we ignore mutational reversions, the ancestral and derived genotypes are connected by six possible forward trajectories through sequence space. So the key question then is, is whether all of these possible pathways are equally accessible to natural selection. If not, then what that tells us is that the is that evolution may be more likely to follow some pathways rather than others. So this, this just shows hypothetical trajectories of phenotypic change associated with each of the six pathways. Now this example, let, let's, let's assume that, that selection favors an increased hemoglobin oxygen affinity. So this is what we might expect in the case of a lowland species that has recently colonized a high altitude environment. So under that assumption, what you can see here is that there are exactly two forward pathways that yield monotonic increases in the selected phenotype. That is, each successive mutational step is either neutral or beneficial. And by contrast, each of the remaining four, four pathways include a single mutational step that produces a transient reduction in the selected phenotype, potentially representing a fitness valley. So the important point is that the, the, the distinction between these monotonic and non-monotonic pathways simply stems from the fact that the sign of a mutation's phenotypic effect depends on which other mutations have already occurred. Right, because in each of these six cases, we, we have the same ancestral starting point, we have the same preordained endpoint, and, and they all involve the same combination of three mutations. The only thing that's different is the sequential order in which those mutations become fixed. So the, the, the important point here is that, that uh, sign epistasis can, can exert a deterministic influence on protein evolution by constraining the number of selectively accessible mutational pathways to high fitness genotypes. And so the important implication is that this can potentially enhance the repeatability and therefore predictability of molecular adaptation. Now the important thing to point out is, th is that this notion of deterministic repeatability applies specifically to replicated changes across um, independent realizations of the, of the evolutionary process that are initiated from the same ancestral starting point. So this is like analogous to the, the, the Stephen Jay Gould rewind the tape experiment. But questions about parallelism and convergence in naturally evolved proteins pertain to replicated changes among evolving lineages that by definition have disparate ancestral starting points. And so in this case, uh, synapstasis can, can reduce the probability of parallel substitution simply because it reduces the number of possible mutations that have unconditionally beneficial effects on divergent genetic backgrounds. So for example, consider a pair of, of closely related species 
B and D. So if we have the same mutation at the, the same site in both species, um, it seems pretty likely that that mutation will, will produce the same phenotypic effect uh, simply because there's been little opportunity for divergence in sequence context during the short period of time that has elapsed since those two species shared a common ancestor. By contrast, if the same mutation occurs on the background of species J, it's far more likely that that mutation will produce a distinct phenotypic effect simply because there's been far more opportunity for divergence in sequence context. Specifically, there's been, been more opportunity for divergence at potentially interacting sites. So the point is that the, the, the influence of epistasis on, on parallel evolution is, is, is an open question, and there are a lot of um, uh, interesting ideas to explore. All right, so with that conceptual overview, let me now just take a few moments to, to provide some background information about our, our model protein. So as most of you probably know, the, the primary function of vertebrate hemoglobin is to transport oxygen from the respiratory surfaces to the cells of aerobically metabolizing tissues. So the protein is a heterotetramer. It's composed of two alpha chain subunits and two beta chain subunits. And each one of these subunit polypeptides contains a heme iron that reversibly binds a single dioxygen molecule. Now in amniote vertebrates, these different subunit types are encoded by different sets of duplicated genes that are located on different chromosomes. Now this, this figure just provides a, 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 a schematic summary of the, the allosteric regulation of hemoglobin function. So up here we have the, the basic um, oxygenation reaction. <clears throat> and then this graph here shows what are called oxygen equilibrium curves. So these curves just show how the, the percent oxygen saturation of hemoglobin varies according to the, the partial pressure of oxygen. And as you may remember from your bio, biochemistry courses, the, the sigmoidal shape of the curves reflects the cooperativity of oxygen binding. Now the, the standard way to, to measure the position of these curves is to use what's called the P50 value. So this is simply the, the, the partial pressure of oxygen at which hemoglobin is half saturated. So the higher the, the P50, the lower the oxygen affinity because you have a, a higher PO2 to achieve the same half saturation value. So what this graph shows is that hemoglobin oxygen affinity is reduced in the presence of these allosteric cofactors like um, chloride ions and organic phosphates. Now these allosteric cofactors have the effect of reducing hemoglobin oxygen affinity because they preferentially bind and stabilize deoxyhemoglobin in this so-called T-state conformation. And by doing this, it, it, it shifts the allosteric equilibrium in favor of this low affinity quaternary structure. So for example, in, in mammalian red blood cells, the most potent allosteric regulator of hemoglobin function is this organic phosphate DPG, which is a metabolite of glycolysis. So as you can see here, DPG electrostatically binds in this cleft between the, the beta chain subunits of deoxyhemoglobin. And again, by doing this, it, it stabilizes that low affinity T-state conformation. So the important point is that amino acid mutations that either directly or indirectly impair DPG binding can produce a significant increase in hemoglobin oxygen affinity. So this is a, a, a potentially important mechanism of, of biochemical adaptation. Okay, with that background information, let, let's now delve into the empirical case studies. And let's start with this, this comparison between um, two sister species of, of pikas, Okotona princeps and Okotona calaris. So these are, these are sister species that diverged about four to six million years ago, and these are the only two species of pika in North America. And the reason that this is such a nice comparison is that, that these are ecologically quite similar species 
but they have dramatically different elevational range limits. So Okotona princeps is a true alpine specialist. In, in, the, in the Rocky Mountains, in the Sierra Nevada, these guys are, are, felt, are found well above Kimberline, and they're rarely ever found much below about 3,700 meters. By contrast, Okotona calaris is um, distributed through Alaska and northwestern Canada. And these guys are, are, are pretty much restricted to, to sea level environments or near sea level environments. These guys are also found above timberline typically, but, but at such high latitudes, timberline occurs at a much lower elevation, right? So um, that accounts for their, their different range limits. Now this graph shows a comparison of, of oxygen binding properties for the, the purified hemoglobins of the two species. So on the y-axis we have the, the P50 value, which again is an inverse measure of, of oxygen affinity. And what we've done is we've measured P50 values under four different experimental conditions, which I'll explain. So what this graph shows is that the hemoglobin of the high altitude princeps has a slightly higher intrinsic oxygen affinity. This is indicated by the slightly lower P50 value for stripped hemoglobin, that is, purified hemoglobin that's stripped of, or, of organic, organic phosphates and other allosteric cofactors. And then as you can see, that affinity difference persists in the presence of chloride ions, in the presence of DPG, and in the simultaneous presence of both allosteric effectors. And by the way, this is the treatment that's most relevant to in vivo conditions in the red blood cell. But by, by conducting these measurements under these different uh, treatments, we can gain insights into the functional mechanisms that are responsible for the observed differences in, in hemoglobin oxygen affinity. All right, then by, by cloning and sequencing the, the globin genes of these, these species, we discovered that the, the hemoglobins of Princeps and Calaris differ at a total of five sites, all of which occur in the beta chain subunit. And we then sequenced uh, beta globin genes in these other um, pica species, and this allowed us to perform an, ancest an ancestral sequence reconstruction. And this review this revealed that of the five substitutions that distinguish the two species, um, three occurred on the branch leading to Princeps, and two occurred on the branch leading to Calaris. All right, so then we, we synthesized recombinant hemoglobin mutants representing the, the, the reconstructed ancestor, as well as the wild type genotypes of both Princeps and Calaris, and then by conducting a triangulated comparison between, or a triangulated comparison involving this, this resurrected ancestral protein and each of the two descendant proteins, we were able to determine that the, the increased hemoglobin oxygen affinity of princeps represents a derived character state, whereas the, the lowland Calaris has simply retained the ancestral low affinity um, phenotype. And so what this, this tells us is that the, the derived increase in hemoglobin oxygen affinity that occurred in the Princeps lineage must be attributable to the independent or joint effects of substitutions at these three sites, at sites 5, 62, and 126. So we then synthesized each of the possible mutational intermediates that connect the, the ancestral low affinity genotype and the derived high affinity genotype of Okotona princeps. And by measuring the functional properties of each of these different mutants, we discovered that, that each of the causative mutations have highly context dependent effects. So for example, in the case of the first site, <coughs> at site five, this glycine to alanine substitution produced a significant increase in oxygen affinity when it occurred as the first step in the pathway, that is, when it occurred on the ancestral background, but it produced the opposite effect. It produced a, a reduced oxygen affinity when it occurred as the final step in the pathway, that is, when it occurred on a background in which the other two substitutions had already occurred. And the same is true for the next site. At site 62, this alanine to threonine substitution 
produced a, a, a significant increase in oxygen affinity when it occurred as the first step in the pathway, but then it produced the opposite effect when it occurred as the final step in the pathway. By contrast, at, at site 126, this alanine to valine substitution produced consistent affinity enhancing effects across all four genetic backgrounds. Although even in this case, the, the magnitude of that increase varied across backgrounds. So the upshot of this was that only one of six possible forward pathways yielded a monotonic increase in hemoglobin oxygen affinity. So this tells us something important about the, the mapping function that relates genotype to phenotype. And it also illustrates how, in principle, um, epistasis can constrain mutational pathways of adaptive protein evolution. The other interesting thing is that, as you can see here, the, the, uh, the, the epistasis is mediated by, by interactions uh, between structurally remote sites. So, so the, the, uh, the side chains of the, of the interacting residues are not in direct steric contact. So what this tells us is that the, is that the, the interaction effects clearly stem from, from indirect uh, second order perturbations, possibly involving the, the allosteric transition in, in quaternary structure. And so we're, we're currently solving the, the crystal structure of pipohemoglobin to figure out the, the, the biophysical basis of these these long-range indirect interaction effects. Okay, so let, let's now move from pikas to, to deer mice. So deer mice are a really great uh, study species for, for research on, on high altitude adaptation for a number of reasons. Uh, with regard to their biology, one of the interesting things is that this species has the, the broadest elevational distribution of any North American mammal. So these guys are, are found in lowland prairie and desert habitats. And they also range into high alpine environments at elevations up to 4,300 meters, which is as high as you can go in, in the contiguous US. Now, our, our previous work had demonstrated that um, there's this uh, genetic difference in, 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 in hemoglobin function between mice that are native to different elevational zones. So as you can see here, the, the hemoglobins of, of high altitude mice are characterized by a slightly higher intrinsic oxygen affinity. This is indicated by a, 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 slightly, liar, a st slightly lower P50 for stripped hemoglobin. And then there's a much higher oxygen affinity in the presence of DPG and chloride. So in, in contrast to the case with the pikas, where the, where the evolved change in, in, in hemoglobin oxygen affinity was purely attributable to changes in intrinsic affinity, here there's a slight difference in intrinsic affinity that's compounded by a, a qualitative shift in the, in the mode of allosteric regulation. So it's a different functional mechanism. Now by, by by conducting a survey of, of sequence polymorphism in the duplicated alpha and beta globin genes of these mice, we discovered that the, the allelic variation in hemoglobin function must be attributable to the independent or joint effects of 12 amino acid replacements. So there are um, eight changes in the alpha chain subunit and then four in the beta chain subunit. Now as it turns out, the, the naturally occurring structural variation in deer mouse hemoglobin has a highly modular organization, which mainly just reflects the, the, the linkage relationships among the, the polymorphic sites. So the upshot of this is that we can capture virtually all of the, the naturally occurring structural variation by synthesizing a set of eight recombinant hemoglobin mutants representing all possible genotypic combinations of allelic variation at three loci. Alpha globin exon 2, alpha globin exon 3, and beta globin. And then by, by measuring the functional properties of, the, of, of these eight mutants, which are, are summarized here as the free energy of, of oxygen binding, we discovered that uh, just over 90% of, of, of the variance in P50 values is attributable to pairwise epistasis. And, and and less than 10% is attributable to additive effects. Now by solving the crystal structure of deer mouse hemoglobin, 
we discovered that each of the eight mutants is characterized by a, a, a unique constellation of hydrogen bonds within and between subunits. So it's the presence and absence of these different hydrogen bonds that accounts for changes in the, the free energy of the allosteric transition and quaternary structure between the oxy and deoxy states. So this is what accounts for, for the fact that the same mutation can have affi affinity enhancing effects on one background, but affinity reducing effects on a different background. So for example, in the case of the, the alpha chain subunit, at site 50, the side chain of this histidine forms a hydrogen bond with the side chain of this conserved glutamate residue at site 30 in the same subunit. Now when that histidine is replaced by proline, as it is in the, the, the high, high altitude allelic variant, that hydrogen bond is eliminated and that can produce a, uh, 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 a significant perturbation of tertiary structure depending on, on whether these other two hydrogen bonds are present or absent. So the point is that this amino acid change at site 50 Basically, the, the, the phenotypic effect of, of this change at site 50 depends critically on the, allele, on the allelic state at these other two sites, at alpha-113 and beta-128. Now, just to, to highlight what I think is an interesting nexus between protein biochemistry and population genetics, uh, I, I pulled these, these two quotations from the, the, the renowned structural biologist Max Perutz, who um, won the Nobel Prize by solving the crystal structure of hemoglobin, and then the, the equally renowned population geneticist, Dick Lewinton. So our results for these mammalian hemoglobins are, are certainly consistent with this idea that uh, um, whatever you do in one part of the molecule affects the molecule as a whole, and, and if nothing else, our, our, res our results are also um, consistent with this, this uh, idea that, that uh, context and interaction are of the essence. Okay, in the time remaining, I want to tell you about some, some work that we've been doing more recently uh, involving avian hemoglobins. This is, a, this is work that was, that's been spearheaded by a postdoc in my lab, uh, Chandru Natarajan. So over the past five years, we've been conducting this systematic comparative study of hemoglobin function involving these, these phylogenetically replicated comparisons between 28 pairs of high and low altitude Andean birds. So these are, are, are phylogenetically replicated comparisons in the sense that um, each pair of, of high and low altitude taxa are more closely rela related to one another than they are to any, any of the other taxa. And as you can see, in some cases we're making comparisons between high and low altitude populations of the same broadly distributed species and in other cases, we're making comparisons between species. But in every case, we're, we're making comparisons between, um, between populations or species that have dramatically different elevational range limits. All of the, the high altitude taxa uh, were sampled at, at extremely high altitudes, in, in, in most cases uh, upwards of 4,500 or 5,000 meters. So these are all pretty extreme uh, species. Now, one of the interesting things about birds, or one of the interesting things about avian red blood cells specifically, is that during adulthood, they, they co-express two structurally and functionally distinct hemoglobin isoforms. So there's a minor isoform, HBD, which incorporates the alpha chain subunits of this alpha D globin gene. And then there's a, the major isoform, HBA, which incorporates the alpha chain subunits of this alpha A globin gene. And so in each of the, in each of the species pairs that we're examining, for, for each taxon, we're, we're um, measuring the relative abundance of the two isoforms, and then we're also um, uh, isolating and purifying each isoform uh, independently and measuring the, the distinct functional properties. Okay, so before I, I show you the results for the, 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 the full set of comparisons, I'll just show you a, a few um, illustrative case studies that, that um, um, highlight a, a, a couple interesting discoveries. 
So here we have a, a nice comparison between these two subspecies of, of Andean house wrens. So the, the high altitude individuals were, were sampled at uh, elevations of, of uh, 4,300 to 5,000 meters. And these guys are from, from sea level. And so here I'm just showing you results from uh, the experimental treatment where uh, we're measuring oxygen affinities in the presence of, of, of uh, um, allosteric cofactors. What you can see is, is the, the highland species have, um, for, for both the HBA and HBD isoforms, they have um, higher oxygen affinities relative to those of the, the lowland subspecies. And it's a, a, a really significant difference. Now in this particular case, this, uh, this, this really pronounced difference in protein function is attributable to a single amino acid replacement at site 55 in the beta chain, which is located at this uh, intersubunit contact surface. One of the other interesting things about this particular amino acid change is that the, the underlying, the, the underlying um, nucleotide change involves, a, um, involves the elimination of what's called a CPG dinucleotide. So when you have a, a C followed by a G, this is at the nucleotide level, if you have, when you have a C followed by a G on the same coding strand, then depending on the methylation status of that C, um, both sites have uh, uh, highly elevated mutation rates relative to non-CPG sites. So uh, the fact that this uh, function-altering mutation uh, involved this, um, this, uh, this, this change at highly mutable sites uh, suggests that, that this may be an example of, of mutation-biased adaptation. And, and then to confirm the effect of the specific mutation, we, we engineered that, that mutation into the uh, ancestral background and measured this 25% reduction in, in, in P50 value. So this exactly recapitulates the observed difference that we, we documented in the comparison between the, the, the native hemoglobin variants. So this is a rare case where we have this really large difference in, in protein function that's attributable to the, the effects of a, of a single mutation. In other cases, uh, it's typically uh, multiple mutations that, that uh, are responsible. Now the hummingbirds have proved to be an interesting group as well. So for this initial um, study of, of hemoglobin evolution in, in hummingbirds, we focused on these Ten species that are representative of each of the each of the, the major clades of, of Andean hummingbirds, and we we purposely chose species that have dramatically different elevational range limits, so we can make uh, comparisons between relatively closely closely related species um, that you know, have have uh, dramatic differences in their their, their distribution. So one of the things that we discovered is that there's this, this striking um, negative correlation between the, the hemoglobin P50 value and native elevation. Or equivalently, this is a positive correlation between hemoglobin oxygen affinity and native elevation. So in this particular graph, we're, we're showing, I'm showing you the, uh, uh, a linear regression based on phylogenetically independent contrasts. So this is just... Uh, these are comparisons that account for the phylogenetic relationships among the, the 10 different species. So it's a really striking elevational trend, and we've now added more species to this, and, and the, the trend is even stronger. And one thing that we noticed is that the, the, the increased hemoglobin oxygen affinities in the highland species were associated with these repeated changes at this pair of sites in the beta chain subunit, sites 13 and 83. So to, to, to show you the, the net effect of, of changes at these two sites, I'll, I'll show you just one representative comparison between these two species at the top here. Um, 
the Andean hill star hummingbird is a true high altitude specialist. These guys are only found above 4,000 meters. And then the speckled hummingbird is, is pretty much just found at sea level. Now, the, humming, the, the, the hemoglobins of these two species um, are structurally almost identical. They only differ at these two sites, at beta 13 and beta 83. And so as you can see, in the presence of allosteric effectors, the, uh, the hemoglobin of the highland species has a much higher oxygen affinity than that, of, than that of the lowland species. This comparison between the native variants allows us to measure the net effect of, of these two mutations. But then, again, by using the site-directed mutagenesis approach, we were able to document that this change is, is mainly attributable to um, this replacement just at beta 83. So um, in the hummingbirds, again, we, we documented this really striking pattern of, of parallel substitution involving the single site. And so now the question is whether this pattern is, is um, evident in our, in our broader comparison. And the answer is, is yes. So th this just shows a plot of, of P50 values for, matched, for, for 27 matched pairs of high and low altitude sister taxa. So this is, on this axis, we have P50 for the, the high altitude taxon, and then here we have P50 for the low altitude taxon. As you can see, the majority of data points fall below the diagonal, indicating that, on average, the, um, the, the highland species ha tend to have um, higher hemoglobin oxygen affinities. They're only um, a couple cases where that's not the case, and, and these both involve comparisons between um, conspecific populations. And almost all of the comparisons between species, with, with, with one exception, the, the highland species always has the higher hemoglobin oxygen affinity. And this is also the case for the HBD isoform. Here we have a, a slightly lower sample size, uh, simply because some of the ground doves and hummingbirds do not express the HBD isoform. But again, it's a highly significant um, pattern. So we've documented this really uh, striking pattern of convergence in, in, in hemoglobin function. So now the question is, do these convergent increases in, in hemoglobin oxygen affinity require parallel substitutions at the amino acid sequence level? And the answer is um, sometimes yes, but, but most of the time no. So this is just summarizing um, the, all of the amino acid differences that distinguish the, the, the major hemoglobin isoforms of, of, the, um, of all of our um, um, taxon pairs. There are just 27 pairs shown here because there was one pair that, that had stru structurally identical hemoglobins. But what you can see here is that there are, there are a few pretty striking patterns of, of parallelism. Alpha, one thir or alpha 13, especially alpha 77, and beta 13. Now, in each of these cases, we, we've done the mutagenesis experiments. And it turns out that none of these parallel substitutions produce um, uh, discernible changes in, in, in hemoglobin function. So these are all, you know, especially this one here at alpha 77, a really striking parallel substitution, but it appears to be functionally inconsequential. The other interesting thing about all three of these sites is that, again, these, these all involve the, the recurrent elimination of CPG dinucleotides. So these are expected to be uh, especially mutable sites. So I'll, I'll just pause here to just um, highlight a, a, a couple uh, object lessons. One is that uh, these results suggest that mutation bias may exert a strong influence on patterns of parallel substitution. The other important point is that parallel substitutions do not necessarily produce convergent changes in protein function. And the important point here is that patterns of parallelism cannot just be taken as face value and interpreted as evidence for positive selection. 
you, you really have to do the, 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 the functional tests. Now, there are a, a, a few cases where parallel substitutions have produced convergent changes in hemoglobin oxygen affinity, specifically convergent increases in, in different high altitude species. So for example, there's uh, beta-83 in the, in the hummingbirds that, that I already mentioned, a really striking pattern of, of, of parallel substitution. And then we have a, couple, uh, a few cases at beta-94 in two different waterfowl species and then in this uh, pair of uh, ground doves. So um, what can we say about these general patterns? In the, where do we place the boundary between what, what Gould referred to as um, predictability under invariant law and the multifarious possibilities of historical contingency? In other words, at what scale or level of focus can evolution be characterized as predictable? Well, to address these questions, I'll, I'll just summarize our, our results to date. So our experiments revealed that, that high altitude species typically have evolved a derived increase in hemoglobin oxygen affinity. So this is a, a very well-supported pattern of phenotypic convergence. So at the level of biochemical phenotype, clearly the patterns are, are highly repeatable and predictable. However, convergent changes in protein function do not necessarily require parallel changes at the amino acid sequence level. So at this level, the, 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 the predictability breaks down. And one interesting pattern that is especially pronounced in the hummingbirds is that um, the, the function altering um, parallel substitutions that we did observe tended to be phylogenetically circumscribed. These, these were typically, um, uh, the function altering parallelisms were typically restricted to, to specific clades like the hummingbirds and were not um, uh, contributing to convergent changes in protein function more broadly. And, um, and there are a number of different explanations for this, but, but given the prevalence of epistasis, Pervasive parallelism, pervasive parallelism at the amino acid sequence level is not necessarily ex expected. This is simply because identical substitutions may often have different effects on the genetic backgrounds of different species. So this is just a hypothesis to explain that, that pattern of, of uh, that, that parallelisms tend to be phylogenetically concentrated. And we're now testing this by um, by doing some, some uh, kind of fun experiments. We're, so having identified each of the different mutations that have contributed to convergent increases in hemoglobin oxygen affinity in different high altitude birds, we're then engineering those same mutations into resurrected ancestral proteins representing uh, progressively more ancient nodes in the, the avian phylogeny. And this will allow us to, to, to uh, determine whether the effects are, are indeed context dependent and, and it'll give us some sense of the, the level of, of uh, um, sequence divergence that, that's important for, for context dependent effects. This is something that we're currently doing now. So with that, um, I want to acknowledge the people that contributed to this work, especially a couple postdocs in my lab, Chandru Natarajan and Amit Kumar and also my collaborator Chris Witt at the University of New Mexico who um, provides the ornithological expertise. And finally, I, I thank all of you for your attention.